Check this out. True Goy the Dove, rest in peace. It's all happening. That is Have you seen this image? This is a picture of the promo flyer for De La Soul's seminal 1989 release, Three Feet High and Rising. It's pretty minimalistic, all things considered. Here's a floppy haired guy dressed in a business suit holding a colorful album cover with headshots of three natural headed youths in a circle surrounded by some day glow colored daisy flower petals. On the left it reads, I came in for you too. I came out with De La Soul, Three Feet High and Rising. At the bottom of the flyer is a quote from the LA Times, the Sergeant Pepper of the 80s. The Sergeant Peppers of the 80s. Now that's a strikingly shrewd advertisement for a rap album in the 1980s, a very confrontational, politically charged and gangster rap laden era. I mean, seriously, think about this. It literally screams, hey boomers, you like the Beatles? Why don't you give De La Soul a listen? Hailing from Amityville, Long Island, De La Soul united in the late 1980s. Pasta News, True Boy, and Maceo's demo tape, Plug Tunin, caught the ear of Stetsasonic producer Prince Paul, who helped the group secure a record deal with Tommy Boy Records. Their first album, Three Feet High and Rising, was a critical and commercial success by every measure. De La's colorful presentation, leather Africa medallions, and dawning of the Daisy Age proclamations jutted out like the Freedom Tower in comparison to their contemporaries. The Inner Soul, y'all. That's what Daisy Age stood for. It was an acronym for The Inner Soul, y'all. Dave, aka True Boy the Dove, aka Plug too, described how their suburban upbringing impacted their perspective. Being here made us see just a different light. I mean, people in the Bronx might have seen, you know, crime on an everyday basis and might have seen uh, problems within the community on an everyday basis. I think being out here just basically opened up our mind. It wasn't like cluttered with all the noise and all the crime and all the, you know, all the, I guess, things that every other rapper is talking about. De La's Daisy Age motif, along with their distinctive brand of melody, wittiness, tongue-in-cheek humor, had heads calling them hip-hop hippies. Hip-hop hippies. And that actually makes sense if you think about it. That was part of their marketing plan. They were the Sgt. Pepper of the 80s, remember? And while hit songs like Me, Myself, and I, I Know, and Buddy, along with their imaginative and inventive sampling of pop, rock, funk, jazz, you name it, while that all pushed sonic boundaries and pushed three feet high and rising to platinum status, De La wasn't actually cool with being marginalized as hip hop hippies. Here's what Dave told The Guardian. If some think we have a hippie style and a hippie sound, that's fine. But we'd be offended if it was said that we wanted to be hippies. We don't. We just want to be ourselves. Our music is raw and is funky, but at the same time, it's deeply soulful because this is the daisy age and this is the sound from within. Rap doesn't have to come off with hard bass lines and heavy kicks and snares. People sometimes want to listen to soft music, even the hardcore crowd. De La was so bent on shedding its self-created image that for their second album, the group did the unthinkable. It killed itself. Battling the stresses that come with crafting a classic debut, label pressure to recapture lightning in a bottle, dissatisfaction with the hippies of hip hop designation, creative pigeonholing due to their unique sound, the trio destroyed all previous misconceptions of themselves with the release of their sophomore album, 1991's De La Soul is Dead. This loosely based concept album was much darker than their debut. Not only did the record address societal issues such as drug addiction on My Brother's a Basshead and abuse on Millie Pulled a Pistol on Santa, but the LP itself was littered with interludes of kids dissing the album while listening to it. De La Soul is Dead challenged listeners sonically and conceptually while simultaneously shedding the lighthearted hippies of hip hop image misunderstood on Three Feet High and Rising. Although the album failed to meet the commercial benchmark set by its predecessor, it's another hip hop classic in its own right, even receiving the coveted five mics in the source. And most importantly, it would become the first time De La Soul successfully evolved past pigeonholing a trend that will continue for the rest of the group's 30 plus year career.
where 1993's Balloon Mind State showcased an evolved sound with a Maceo Parker saxophone instrumental, introspective rhymes highlighting their maturity, a first time collaboration with Gangstar MC Guru, rest in peace, 1996's Stakes is High on the other hand, and its commentary on hip hop's artistic decline is not only considered one of De La's top works, but has arguably proven prophetic over time. Where 2000's Artificial Intelligence's promise of three albums released within one year fell one installment short of fulfillment due to label complications which became synonymous with the group, AOI Mosaic Thump and AOI Bionics featured collaborations with Redman, Chaka Khan, Devin the Dude, Be Real, Busta Rhymes, Exhibit, Beastie Boys, among others across the two albums, as well as radio-friendly production, served as a reminder that De La could successfully reemerge from the underground and swim in the mainstream. An underground which ironically arguably began with stakes as high in the first place. We broke that down in the Nas De La Soul breakdown. Check it out if you missed it. 2004's The Grind Day is a testament to De La's ability to trim the fat and compile a sleek, dynamic listen that reinforces the impact and influence they've had on rap as a whole and the necessity to preserve hip hop culture before it's too late. Jake One, Mad Lib, Jay Dilla, Ninth Wonder, and Super Dave West handle production. Common, Carl Thomas, Flavor Flav, Ghostface, MF Doom all make appearances. It's a hyper rewindable late career release that's become my personal favorite over time. And 2016's The Anonymous Nobody shocked the industry when De La Soul financed the album by putting together a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds for the release. Their goal was to raise $100,000 and they shattered it by improbably raising $600,000 plus. If there was ever any doubt of the power of whether De La Soul could still move masses, all questions were answered after that campaign. The finished product even impressed the voting members at the Recording Academy as And The Anonymous Nobody was nominated for Best Rap Album at the Grammys, a first in their story career. It's all happening. We covered that in the Inside De La Soul's $600,000 album breakdown. Check it out if you missed it. Now, De La Soul is probably the group that I've covered most often in my career. My very first big interview was with De La Soul at the 2010 Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival. The very first Hip Hop DX breakdown we did that went viral was Tupac and De La Soul's Forgotten Rap Beef. If you haven't seen that episode, punch yourself in the face. I've interviewed dozens of different artists over the course of my career as well and asked them about De La Soul's impact and influence. They always find a great personal way to describe how many doors De La opened for artists to be themselves. Here's two, here's two that still resonate with me today. The first one, Pharaoh Munch. The amazing thing about De La Soul for me is how they can simultaneously be veteran hip hop legends and make current music with the hunger and excitement of a freshman. They allowed me as an artist to be totally comfortable and honest with my art expression my style and my voice. They are hands down one of my greatest influences in hip hop. They may be the most underrated group in music history, yet still world renowned. De La Soul has the kind of career that I desire to have, and they make the kind of music that I continually aspire to make. They are quite frankly the best, hands down. They allowed me as an artist to be totally comfortable and honest with my art expression, my style, and my voice. Weighty compliment coming from Pharaoh Munch. Absolutely true, beautifully stated. Now the second comment, the second response that still resonates with me deeply is from DJ J period. Here's what he said. As an artist, the highest compliment I've ever been paid is by De La Soul. When they told me that the way I put my mixtapes together reminds them of their own work. Wow, I mean, these guys wrote the book on creativity, subtlety, attention to detail, and they embody the absolute best of hip hop culture. Newcomers today don't even realize the extent to which De La's creative influence has affected every corner of this music, especially those like myself who strive to further the culture and push boundaries in our own right. Challenging conventional wisdom, exploring every creative possibility, speaking so powerfully that it impacts a whole generation, that's true artistry. 
That's De La Soul. Challenging conventional wisdom, exploring every creative possibility, speaking so powerfully that it impacts a whole generation. That's true artistry. That's De La Soul. Big, big facts. De La Soul's sound, aesthetic, and willingness to be different was pioneering when they arrived in the 1980s, and now their influence is plastered all over modern rap acts. De La's original Daisy Age motif had many referring to them as hip hop hippies, for example. Kendrick Lamar, J Rock, Schoolboy Q, and Absol were part of a unit called Black Hippie, and just about every member of Black Hippie moves left of center. Kanye West has championed a tribe called Quest, who is a part of Native Tongues along with De La Soul. De La debuted a year before Tribe. Star and Lord Jamar even credited De La Soul for paving the way for Drake. Drake! DJ Vlad asked De La about what Star and Lord Jamar had said. Dave responded to those comments like this. He said, And I think De La came in and allowed the person, the least expected person to be a rapper, the opportunity to rap. The least expected person to, you think, would be listening to rap, say what he's saying and not associate to what's popping right now. And I think that, I think that's what maybe Star might be saying to the extent of, we gave the opportunity for the least expected person coming from the left to shine. We gave the opportunity for the least expected person coming from the left to shine. That's it. That's it right there. The point is this. Hip Hop shed a collective tear this week when All Hip Hop broke the news that De La Soul founding member Dave Trugoy the Dove, Plug 2, had passed away. Dave revealed he'd been battling congestive heart failure in 2017 during the intro to Royalty Capes off and the anonymous Nobody. His passing comes at a time of celebration for the trio since for the first time ever, their first six albums will be available on streaming services on March 3rd following Tommy Boy's sale to Reservoir Media. Dave was instrumental in calling for a boycott of Tommy Boy and its CEO, Tom Silverman, for reportedly negotiating four terms with the group over streaming royalties. And in that sense, De La Soul never shortchanged themselves in their bars, nor in the boardroom. They're a towering example of the power of staying true to self, staying true to the community, and staying true to the culture while ushering in opportunities for the least expected person coming from the left to shine brilliantly in this fickle industry of cool. I mean, I can't even imagine what hip hop would look like without De La Soul. What would that even look like? Fortunately, I don't have the answer to those questions. Rest in peace, Dave. Thank you. Status another Saturday, another TBD. Thank you guys for rocking with me each week. I really appreciate it. Uh, this one hit me, hit me, hit me in a very real way. De La Soul, De La Soul has always been one of the uh, shining examples, in my opinion, of how much room there really is in hip hop for all different types of personalities, people of different backgrounds, uh, people with different styles and people with different messages. The Grind Date has risen to the level of my favorite De La Soul album in recent years, but AOI Bionics is also one of my 24 most important albums. That's why it's here on the wall. Uh, I think a great way to show truly how much, how much uh, De La Soul has added to hip hop, added to the culture, and added to the community is for all of us to go stream all of their albums when they're available on March 3rd on all streaming platforms. Uh, my condolences to the De La Soul family, to Dave's family, also to the family of Poss and Mace and anyone who's ever loved De La Soul. Um, this week, let me know what your favorite De La Soul album is, your favorite De La Soul songs, and where do they rank in the pantheon, pantheon, excuse me, pantheon of rap groups of all time? Uh, I think that's a good question to, to, to talk about this week in the comments section. So let me know, analysts, what you think. Where does De La Soul rank in terms of groups, all time groups in hip hop history? Also, got to shout out the analysts. Got to shout out the analysts. Thank you guys for the incredible analysis, commentary, conversations you offer to the comment section each week is truly priceless. And also, thank you all who've donated to the channel, helping us forward this mission each week. It truly is priceless. 
My name is Justin Hunt. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow at the company man on everything. And as always, it's all happening. When, it, when, when you got music that black people control and black people have something to at least show and say, you know, we're proud of what we're doing. It's always pimped and it's always turned into a money vehicle and it's always dried out. But I think because of the fact that we as the youth and as black people, we love, we love rap, we love hip hop, and we're gonna do our best to keep it living.